Hi, everyone. This is Rob Barnett, and I'd like to welcome you to today's BI Energy Exchange, where we talk about our research and the latest developments in energy market. We've got the whole team here today. We've got Sally Ilmaz joining from Dubai, where it is clearly dark in your background there. Thanks for staying late. Here in London, we've got Will Hares and Patricio Alvarez uh, just sitting uh, over from me. And in New York at 731 Lexington, we've got Fernando Valley joining us. So I think it's going to be a great conversation. And it has certainly been a tumultuous few days in the market. We have Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, and it's failure. We've got uh, clearly concerns about uh, Credit Suisse and other market participants and oil and some of the other energy related commodities and exposed companies seem to be having a challenging time at the moment. I'm just looking at the live screen and it appears Brent is below $75 a barrel at the moment. So let's get some input from the whole team here. Uh, clearly, there is a lot of concern about macro headwinds and how this uh, apparent uh, concerns about the banking industry feed into the broader commodity space. But let's let's do a quick uh, round the room and and share thoughts on kind of the latest moves in oil. Fernando, I'm going to come to you first. There in New York, uh, you hopefully had a first cup of coffee. Give us your read. What what's what's the market telling us right now? Well, I think they're telling you. A, we're concerned about uh, with the fallout from all these bank failures and if it spreads. Uh, but then we're also not going to really look at the fundamentals because all that matters is that potential fallout, eventual layoffs, and a slowdown in uh, in uh, economic activity. We just had the EIA released at 10:30, uh, so about half an hour ago for those uh, in other time zones, uh, and. Big drops in diesel, distillate, uh, distillate in, in gasoline, over 2 million barrels for each, uh, another 500,000 from jet fuel. And even so, we still see a pretty uh, dramatic drop down in both WTI and Brent. Um, and we think that our, our concern had been for a long time that the Fed uh, raising rates and other central banks raising rates would lead to lower consumer demand and that's that's the headwind in the first half of the year before supply took over and seems to be playing out in a different way obviously it's never exactly what you say but it's a similar similar to our call that the consumer is a little bit stretched we also had consumer spending numbers out earlier for february showing a slowdown a little bit better than expected but a slowdown nonetheless um and then uh, so you know the thesis is kind of playing out uh with different um actors in it but we, we think demand is the biggest driver in the first half of the year and it is showing signs of breaking down a little bit and that puts pressure on brent and wti and then as that plays through we'll get to see the impacts of uh, a, a constrained supply chain which will only get worse with wti at 67 dollars a barrel um and and that will uh, ultimately lead to higher prices in our opinion yeah, Will, let's come to you next. How do you read the latest oil dynamics and you know where where do you see us going in in the second half uh, given given what Fernando just said? Do you see it the same way? Yeah, so I, I think obviously it's the banking contagion from the US, so not much more to add um, to Fernando on that front. But I, I think there is there is one other element. The the IEA came out um this morning and, and also said that Russian production uh, in February was near pre-war levels, um, but its combined uh, crude and refined product exports were down by half a million barrels a day. Um, and and to, this is to seven and a half million barrels a day. So uh, they, and they particularly flagged that, that India and China, the two um, primary buyers of discounted uh, Russian crude and, and products, uh, may may be starting to um, uh, struggle with with the amount of um, uh, with the amount of volume, uh, so so th this could also be you know an 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 additive factor in in some of the pressure that um, that we're seeing in in the oil market right now, where Russian crude and, and product has um, you know is struggling to find find a home. Okay, thank you, Will. Uh, we are having some folks uh, saying that they're having some challenges hearing us. Uh, 
sorry, I don't have any guidance on that. I know we can hear each other and if you are having difficulty, we are recording this and we will make the replay available afterwards. So apologies if you're in that camp, but uh, we're gonna go ahead and carry on. Sally, I wanna come to you on the idea of oil macro. You know, I get this sense that the supply demand fundamentals are telling us something kind of different than the sort of very near term kind of macro headwinds we may be seeing in the market. And I want to get your sense, not just on kind of, I, I want to hear what you think about the market, but I also want your sense on how OPEC plays this. Sure. So, I mean, one thing I would add is, uh, apart from the EIA report, we actually had the IEA report as well earlier. And what they said was that they see the market currently in a surplus. They see Russian supply as being extremely resilient, uh, not, not much uh, disruption to Russian supply, uh, which really plays with the uh, thesis that in the first quarter and probably second quarter, the market will probably win a surplus, as Fernando said, and potentially flipping into a deficit in the second half of the year, which may be a completely different story. Uh, but I mean, the reaction that we are uh, seeing today, uh, Brent below $75 a barrel, as you said, WTI below $70 a barrel for the first time since 2021. I mean, I think this could be an overreaction. Uh, I mean, of course, the sentiment uh, seems to be just sell everything uh, type of sentiment at the moment. And I think what Fernando talked about in terms of what can happen to energy demand is valid, especially in the very near term. But then we are uh, keeping our outlook for the fundamentals, for the demand fundamentals for the full year to be quite positive, especially driven by Asia. I think the fears of um, you know the slowdown is mainly uh, for the US and Europe and OECD countries, the revival in demand in Asia, especially as China reopens, especially in the second half, I think may offset any slowdown that we may see um, elsewhere. Um, in terms of uh, OPEC, I mean, th they don't have a full meeting until June, um, but we have a monitoring meeting on April 3rd. And I mean, this is obviously an avenue for them to consider a shift in uh, uh, in supply strategy. And I mean, if we see continued uh, slump in pr prices, I mean, it is very much possible that they may consider even further cuts. And by the way, given how the market is playing out and we are, it's becoming a little bit more apparent that we may actually be in a surplus at the moment is really showing that the at the time controversial uh, decision to cut output is actually turning out to be quite prudent and probably was the right uh, was the right move so um, yeah I think I think today's move probably an overreaction uh, we are actually uh, keeping our outlook for the second half with uh, the risk skewed to the upside still Okay, very interesting. Sounds like we've got some broad agreement across the team. Patricio, I want to bring you on and get your thoughts on the gas side of the equation. Just looking at uh, MBP, TTF here in Europe, all down today. Henry Hub also down in the US. What's the read across into the gas side of the equation in your view? So um, yeah, I think it's it's fairly similar to um, to to the crude outlook, um, but um, in in terms of at least in European gas, I think fundamentals um, are still prevalent. We we are still we're entering a period of of milder weather through the end of of March, so that means that uh, we we pretty much averted any type of risk uh, of, of shortages, despite the curtailment of, of Russian gas, which remains at about 15% of what we used to receive in in 2021. Um, we were sort of in, a, in the near term um, supply glut of, of LNG as well, because LNG uh, continues to be, uh, LNG imports continue to be fairly strong because uh, demand in Asia um, hasn't really picked up um, yet. So, so we, we do see the price sort of finding some support around the 40 euro per megawatt base, which is when the fuel becomes competitive with coal uh, in terms of power generation. Um, and is also an attractive sort of a price for, for LNG buyers in, in Asia to keep on using their, uh, their long-term contracts. Um, so so that's, that's sort of the outlook. We, we do think that the first half perhaps will be a bit weaker, so stay 
close to where we are now. Uh, but similar to the to the crude story, I think um, the big question is as the the, the rebound uh, rebound in, in Chinese demand. I think that that's still the the big uncertainty. Um, and in terms of supply, Europe's uh, supply outlook for gas remains uh, very tight. Um, we haven't fully replaced Russian um, uh, piped gas. Um, we are facing a wider gap of of Russian gas this year, given that most of the curtailments were made in, in September of last year, and now we're facing a full year of, uh, of flows uh, down by about 80%. Um, the, the other risks perhaps will be pot a potential sanctioning of, uh, of Russian LNG. Um, so Europe uh, has actually increased its LNG imports from Russia. Uh, we do see some sanction risk there. Plus, um, there could be a full curtailment uh, via the two remaining pipelines that are still flowing gas uh, into Europe from Russia. Um, and also, we, we need to account for the fact that we've had an incredibly mild winter, um, and that accounted for about 50% of, of the demand savings uh, thus far. So uh, we don't expect that to, to repeat um, in, in the next winter. So we, we do see uh, risks uh, skewed to the upside towards the second half, but we don't expect to see the same level of price volatility that we saw in, in 2022. Okay, very interesting. It sounds like we've got a similar s assessment across the oil and uh, gas space. Uh, what I, with with all of this in mind, okay, Fernando, I want to bring you back into the conversation here and get your sense about what what do you think is the risk to demand that the the market seems to be fixated on because the sort of crux of the story seems to be that, well, industry has for a multi-year period been under-investing in new supply and uh, the CapEx just hasn't been uh, at a level needed to, to, to really get the supply to balance with where demand wants to be. Uh, but is is this just a temporary setback or uh and and really how much demand potential risk would you sort of see over the next uh, 6 to 12 months i think that's the uh, you know probably the, the the best question for oil prices in the next uh, 6 months or 12 months even uh, you know there's several uh risks for demand that uh I think play out from small i think one small that that's probably uh um, alluded to was China's also destocking a little bit. They, they, their inventories were at very high levels, including underground. They were over 1 billion barrels, uh, more than the U.S. Uh, total uh, crude reserves. So they're destocking. So that's been delaying some of the imports and the, the, the demand pull that we were expecting from China. Um, and then Sally also alluded to the slowdown in, in the West and in the U.S., uh, in Europe, in the U.S., and uh, you know there are obvious ramifications. Eventually, China is a primarily export nation, uh, and because the slowdown is a demand drop, and in 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 consumer goods, uh, durable goods that that will tend to repercuss into to China and to their overall growth strategy. So that five percent GDP growth may not be as achievable if Europe is in a full-fledged re recession. If the U.S. consumer is more stretched um, than we perceive. And if the Fed you know, says, I don't care about Silicon Valley Bank, I'm going to keep hiking. Uh, I'm going back to the 50 basis points hike. And if we look at how treasury markets are pricing right now, they expect 100 basis points cut by December. And given that core inflation is still significantly high, and that is theoretically the Fed's mandates, that is not a given. And we could see the impacts of that on overall consumption really being a bit more long lasting than we expect, especially if it leads to impact on the Chinese consumer who is also very uh, thinly stretched already. So those are the largest hit risks to demand and something that in time we think will would still lose to the fact that there hasn't been the investment in the supply chain. Uh, shale production is likely being exhausted uh, especially in the, the, the tier one inventory, um, but that can take that could take longer than the six months we think that it, it will take to play out. That could take 12 months. You know, it could be a 2008-2009 scenario where we are at lower demand levels for uh, an extended period of time. 
uh, especially without credit uh, stimuli from global central banks. Fernando, I want to switch gears a little bit and, and probe on a note that you had out uh, just this morning on Argentina. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a story, not that you asked for it, but uh, just a, a few weeks ago here in London, I went to the uh, Argentinian embassy and met Flavia Royan, who's the energy secretary. And she uh, was here in London to sort of speak about the great shale potential of Argentina, certainly from her perspective. And I, I know you've got a note on it this morning. And we've generally thought of shale as being kind of a, a U.S. story. So tell us about your note. And, you know, are there supply resources, you know, outside of the U.S. shale patch that can help on some of the uh, constraints that we see kind of out in the market when we look out kind of 12, 24 months? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Argentina is a, is a very exciting geological resource, but constrained by political issues and uh, lately a little bit of infrastructure issues. Our note looks at YPF, the Argentinian National Oil Company, and their growth in the Vaca Muerta. Uh, they've done a tremendous job navigating a really difficult hand that they were dealt of high leverage, super sky high inflation, you know, uh, uh, approaching a high. Um, and and they've managed to, you know, partially because oil prices are high, but also some belt tightening and, and, and improved performance out of the Vaca Muerta to reduce their leverage significantly. They're at 1.2 times. may not seem like the lowest leverage compared to Exxon or Chevron that are almost net cash. It's still really impressive. Uh, they've priced their, uh, their crude at about 70 80% of uh, Brent. So, to, to manage that uh, with those kind of uh, handcuffs is really, really something, a uh, feat. Uh, and now the biggest issue that we saw over the past, the next two years, was getting the infrastructure built. Uh, and they're producing a lot of natural gas. Unlike the U.S., they actually have a lot of need for that natural gas internally. Um, and, uh, and eventually they plan to export. But uh, Argentina got financing for their Nestor Kirchner pipeline, They'll export gas from Neuquén to, uh, to, towards Bahia Blanca, uh, and that will help uh, unlock the further development at Vaca Muerta. The big, biggest challenge for YPF over the next two years will be just refinancing debt. They're going to be free cash flow negative uh, at today's prices over the next two years uh, there's, because they're going to be growing and funding these infra infrastructure investments. Um, but they'll need, they'll provide some growth it will offset imports more than anything else, uh, but they, 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 they will need more capital. And if rates continue to go higher, it could again be a risk to supply because they'll rely on refinancing to be able to grow at that pace. Um, a last part is this, you know, the next 12 to 24 months, where else can we add shale? Uh, really just Canada is the only place I would say is uh, at a, uh, that can grow quickly and it's very uh, natural gas uh, heavy. There are liquids in the Kebab and other parts of uh, the Duvernay, and, uh, but it's mostly natural gas weighted. Um, but I'll say that shale is prevalent in many parts of the world. It is the source rock for most of oil and gas. So you know, if you think about uh, Gwar and all the major oil fields in, uh, in Saudi Arabia, UAE, in Western Siberia, they all have a, a, a source rock that can be exploited over time. Okay, Sally, I want to bring you on and get some perspective. Uh, as Fernando was perhaps hinting, the uh, some of the near-term supply growth story may be coming uh, from your region and some of the companies you cover. Uh, what's your expectation on uh, supply? I know uh, Aramco just had uh, earnings this past weekend, and you know what what are they communicating out on that front? So uh, the main uh, area where we're expecting notable supply growth is from Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Um, so Saudi Aramco, the national oil company of Saudi Arabia, and Adnoc, the national oil company of uh, the UAE, they have both committed to invest heavily into their legacy 
uh, oil businesses and increase their um, oil production capacity by 1 million barrels per day by 2027, 2028. So 1 million barrels each. So that would be a total 2 million uh, barrels per day, uh, which is quite significant. But again, I mean, it also shows that it, it, just to increase supply by 2 million barrels per day, this takes a, a lot of investment. And it takes a lot of time to uh, to to bring this uh, on. In terms of Aramco, yeah, I mean, they reported on Sunday. Uh, it wasn't such a surprise that it was a great year for them in 2022. They had net income, adjusted net income of $161 billion, uh, which is just incredible. But again, it's, it's, it's similar to the international oil majors that all had a very good year, that all managed to um, you know, repair their balance sheets further. And the surprise, I think, with Aramco, with their um, uh, 4Q results, was that they actually increased their dividend, their, their quarterly dividend for 4Q from $18.75 uh, billion to $19.5. And this was a surprise because initially they didn't seem too keen uh, to actually increase dividends. They don't really have as much shareholder pressure on dividends as perhaps some of the international majors. And they were saying that they would be prioritizing getting that gearing ratio down uh, and increasing spending, as I, as I said uh, earlier, you know, like really investing back into, um, into, the, into the production and increasing the production capacity. Uh, but I think the fact that they increased their dividend shows a couple of things. One, that 2020 was just a great year, but also uh, I think it shows confidence that they think 2023 will not repeat 2022, but it's still going to be uh, a good year for them. So um, again, on the gearing side, uh, because of the pandemic, they actually went up to more than 20% in their gearing ratio, which they actually never did that before, but they actually managed to go back to a net cash position now, they don't have buybacks like their international peers. So I think it, it does make sense that they went and increased their dividend, um, but it was a surprise for us given some of the remarks that they made earlier. But um, but yeah, it's very strong, very strong quarter, very strong year for them. That's unlikely to repeat this year, but um, but still still very favorable conditions for them, uh, at least in the in the near future. Okay, Will, I want to come to you on the question around supply as well. It, it made a lot of headlines with uh, BP and uh, some of the others indicating that they're going to allocate more CapEx to upstream EMP activities in the near term. And I want to get a sense, where, where are the European oil majors looking for new supply to come from? My, my gut tells me it's probably not from here in Europe, but tell me otherwise. And, you know, how, how are they uh, sort of positioning around uh, supply expansion in the uh, next uh, couple of years? Yeah, so good question, Rob. So, yeah, really against this backdrop of global underinvestment in upstream, which we've seen, you know, dating back to arguably 2015 now, we are starting to see some uh, some upgrades in capital budgets, which have been rolled out for the uh, for the European majors um, and for upstream, we're typically seeing uh, it being focused into deep water is is, is one of the, the main areas. For those with shale left, which is, um, you know, uh, BPX, uh, we're, uh, we'll see a little bit of, um, uh, of capital being deployed there. But I, I've, I'm, I think that, uh, you know, the, the move away from, uh, from uh, the Permian, which we've seen sort of across the peer group over the last several years, has sort of seeded a lot of that um, market share to uh, to the Americans. And so most of these, um, most of the growth that, that we will see, or or sort of growth in the interim um, on on the upstream side, will be from you know major project uh, advancement in. Uh, in in a deep water, so Gulf of Mexico, uh, West Africa, uh, a little bit of Brazil, and and a little bit of um, Southeast Asia. Uh, so the, the, this is really the, the the key area for them, and, and then and of course along with um, some LNG uh, major LNG project advancement as as well. Okay, thank you, Will. Patricia, I want to come to you. Just given that we've had all this turmoil in the market, we've been talking about kind of some of the 
fallout in the commodity space general, generally, but utilities tend to be the sort of safe haven kind of investment uh, when, when the world goes a bit crazy. So I wouldn't just probe a little bit there. What's your setup for when you think about the uh, the EU utility space? Are, are they going to be uh, resilient this year? Sure. So we've. Um, I think a good starting point would be to sort of uh, just a brief commentary on what uh, 2022 earnings were for for European utilities. So um, broadly speaking, they they beat uh, across the board. Uh, we've seen repeated beats on revenue on EBITDA for for 2022, um, which just shows to to the the resilience of of most European utilities diversified uh, global models. So if if they were losing money in in retail energy, they were making money in, in power generation. And if they were not making money in Europe, they were making money in Brazil or, or in the US. Um, so so that, that I think sets up what, what will be um, continued earning strength in, in 2023. Although I do have to note, um, we don't know what the, what the degree of, of the fallout would, would be. So um, not all utilities are built equal. Um, I think uh, the companies with a higher grade of, of regulated earnings, um, especially power transmission assets, which um, are not impacted by, by changes in demand or, or commodity prices, so companies uh, managing transmissions such as Terna in Italy or, or um, National Grid, uh, th those are companies that are, um, yeah, th that are sort of insulated from, from all these forces, at least in the near term. Uh, we, we do see if, um, if sort of there's a, a significant economic uh, downturn, companies with, uh, with retail exposure, so uh, utilities that actually do have uh, direct uh, customers in, in, in households, those could be exposed um, to lower margins. Uh, but again, they, they, they have been able to, to sort of place their, their hedges at higher prices uh, because they managed to lock in uh, higher power prices for this year um, during last year's run-up. Um, so, so we do see sort of improving margin um, tailwinds for 2023, especially because gas prices this year should be lower than 2022, and that will relieve um, all the input costs uh, for, for, for most of uh, European power utilities. So um, that, that's sort of the, the lay of the land for utilities in 2023. But again, uh, I think big caveat on, on which company you look at because each company has a different mix of regulated earnings and also uh, global exposure. All right. Uh, well, you know, we're coming up on time, so we will try to be brief here. Maybe let's just quickly do a, uh, a round robin on the um, on the team here. Uh, we, we will get the band back together uh, on the first Wednesday of next month. But in the interim, I mean, the world seems to be moving so fast and we've got a lot of, um, you know, commodity reaction on, on, on sort of the banking and macro side story. So Solly, you know, do you envision uh, and I know we can generally only speak in scenarios, but you know what what's what's the floor look like uh, when you kind of think about um, oil oil price uh, in in the near term? Any any thoughts on that? I mean, if you um, for Brent, if you asked me just yesterday, I would have said eighty, but uh, I guess I can't say that now. Um, but you know, um, I, I think you're right. Like we we have a couple of weeks until the OPEC meeting, and we really don't know what uh, the rest of the market will be doing, uh, especially on the banking side, and how this story with um, with SVB and Credit Suisse will unfold. But again, this type of sell everything sentiment can be quite powerful. So it is possible that we continue to see continued pressure that can. Uh, push oil prices below, perhaps even below $70 a barrel for Brent. But I think that would be the area where, as I mentioned earlier on the call, uh, below $70 a barrel, I think there's a very good chance uh, that OPEC will be seriously considering another cut to bring prices back above at least $70 a barrel. So, um, but again, there is a couple of weeks until that monitoring meeting. Uh, it's, they're probably not going to call an emergency meeting before that. So uh, let's see what happens in the next couple of weeks. But uh, if, if Brent is below $70 a barrel, uh, I believe uh, OPEC would actually intervene. So I'll, I'll say 70 for Brent. 
All right, um, Will, let's come to you next. I'll just note that during the uh, global financial crisis, oil, I'm just eyeballing it here, but it went from around 150 to sub 40 in very short order. Um, Will, any any thoughts on kind of the, the near term oil market? I mean, I, I think it ultimately will hinge on the response of, of regulators and, and how deep this, this crisis goes. But I, I don't see that this is a 2008, 2009 financial crisis. Uh, so I, I don't think it, it, it'll hit the lows that, that we saw back then. Um, and, and yeah, I, I think by the end of the year, we're, we'll, we'll be looking at a much, much more bullish picture in, in, in the oil price. Um, and and then you, you probably want to be looking at at sec, subsectors which are more responsive to to capital. So looking at looking at the shale producers, some of the E and P's there. I'd steer clear of you know any UK North Sea player given um, given the energy profits levy that we have here, which is weighing down. Um, and then um, yeah, I, I, I think we could see some in the interim some you know pull back on on the buyback levers um for some of the european majors which were which were absolutely massive and hit records last year this this is the sort of flex response that that the um that management teams have um have designed within their within their distribution program so wouldn't be surprised to see that you know given that brent is um you know low 70s at the moment fernando we're going to come to you next uh in any um any sort of thoughts on where we might find a floor for Brent in the in the uh, near term here? So so many thoughts. I think um, first I'm reminded of a, a conversation I had in 2014 with a trader uh, for uh, Big E and P at the time, and he said when oil at that point was about 115 dollars, and he said uh, people don't realize that when oil falls, it doesn't fall 10, 15 dollars. This will get to 50, 60, 70, and we actually got to 29. Um, so I think uh, the the floor is certainly lower if we uh, fall. And I would say I wouldn't be surprised if we if we get a 20, 2008, 2009 moment that we are in the in the, the high 20s uh, for some for some time, not a long time, but for some time. Um, and then I'll, I'll say I, I disagree with Will. I think this has the potential to be a 2008, 2009 because Consumers are very stretched, uh, and, and then we're hiking rates into a recession. And that is a very unique situation where we are restricting investments at a time when demand is also falling. Um, and on top of that, we have strong dollar, uh, which is very difficult for emerging markets. Uh, emerging markets are the driver of uh, higher oil consumption. Um, so, you know, I, I, it remains to be seen, but I, I, I think without a swift change in direction, um, there could be pressure if there is contagion. I mean, I look at so many of these tech firms that they'll never be profitable, right? I, I'm reminded by a, from a, of a post that I read that if, uh, venture capital is typically you, you get one company that works out of 20 and now essentially what the FDIC and the regulators have done is saying no one can fail. And that never works out very well at the end of the day. Fascinating comments. Okay, uh, Patricio, we're gonna come over to you. I'm gonna give you the same question, but for gas, I mean, and just to frame it, uh, uh, we hit a high of almost 350 euros a megawatt hour on a daily close basis for TTF uh, following uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We are sub 45 uh, euros a megawatt hour today. So, uh, you know, gas is, is there a kind of similar setup or kind of what do, what do you see as the near term downside risks of the market? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think because we are, um, I think gas will be weather driven, um, mostly uh, moving forward, given that, that the supply hurdles have been um, somewhat um, mitigated in the near term, uh, especially now that we're exiting winter. So the, I think the first half from here until June, there's probably more downside risk, um, given that that is not heat, heating degree season, just demand is lower during this term. And um, yeah, we, we still have storage levels that are that are quite elevated. Um, 
but moving into the second half, I, again, um, depending on what level of rebound we see in the Chinese economy and thus the demand for LNG uh, reignite there, um, we, we could see the market tight, tighten a bit. So I would expect prices to, to go over, um, over the 50 year mark for, for the second half, perhaps towards 60, 70, which is right around half of what the average was for 2022. Um, so, so long story short, I think second quarter might be a, a tenth of what the peak was in 2022, um, and the second half will probably be more closer to the 70 or 60 euro per megawatt range. Uh, but that depends on on the recovery in China and also uh, how cold of a winter we we do get this this year. Um, um, I, I think one thing that perhaps is, is important to note is that we do have high storage levels, but the, the, the people or the companies uh, holding that storage will not be incentivized to utilize it um, during the, the summer, just because they bought that um, th those gas volumes at much higher prices last year. So they will try and retain them and use LNG as an option. So uh, I don't expect there to be um, you know, a persistent oversupply of, of gas in Europe throughout the year. Okay, thank you so much, Patricia. Thank you, everyone. A uh, quick couple of advertisements. First, uh, I'm going to be in Houston the first couple of days of next week. And so for any of the Houston crowd that's on the call today, uh, if you want to grab a coffee or something, just shoot me an IB or send me an email. I'd, I'd love to see you while I'm there. And then for anyone in New York, uh, we are holding an in-person energy roundtable uh, a week from today, so next Wednesday at 4 p.m. I think a number of you are registered to join, but if you haven't, please join us. Unfortunately, Fernando has decided to take holiday while I'm there, so he won't be joining, but uh, Scott Levine from the team will be uh, partnering up with me as well as Nat Bullard from Bloomberg NEF. So come and join us. We'll have a very fun and personal conversation a week from today in New York. Or if uh, if you can't make it to that, I'm happy to try to see you otherwise. And so I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, all of our research can be found at BI Go on your terminal. And we have a very active uh, client chat that you are welcome to join if you're not already a member. So hit us up for information on that too if you're interested and otherwise we will see you on the first Wednesday of uh, next month so take care everyone and thanks a lot for your time